Well, welcome to another Lightblade Learning Lab. In the last session, we changed the tube in this machine. And today, we're going to look at ways of characterizing that tube. Over time, the tube is going to gradually decrease in power. Now, it won't just drop off the edge of a cliff unless something seriously mechanical goes wrong with the tube. And that's very, very rare. Most of the time, what will happen is this tube will run perfectly okay for months and months and months. You may determine that you've got a little bit less power. Because losing power can happen at several places throughout this system. As we've talked about before in earlier sessions, you have three mirrors, you have a lens, and at each one of those stages, typically, you would expect to lose maybe 3% power. Now, I'm not going to get too angle about that number because, you know, 3% is just an average. If it gets to 5% loss, i.e. you've got one, two, three, four features in there, four fives is 20%. That's one-fifth of your power that you're losing before you get down to your work surface. Now, that would be very noticeable if you're used to cutting, for instance, something at 10 millimeters a second, and then all of a sudden you find that it doesn't cut through. What do you do? Well, your first reaction might be, well, I'll put more power into the system. Well, if you're already running at the maximum allowable current, you can't do that because you will start shortening your tube life. The only solution is to do one of two things. Short term, if you're in a hurry, you might decide to turn the speeds down so that you get good cutting again. But of course, that's a temporary fix. What you really got to do is to go into your machine and find out whether you've got loss of power on your tube or whether you've got loss of power because of one, two or three mirrors being dirty or maybe you need to clean or you might need a new lens. You've got to find out where the problem is. And that's partially what we're going to be talking about today. Now, characterising the tube basically means what we're going to do is we're going to try and establish the relationship between the power that we're putting on the keyboard, the milliamps that we can see on the ammeter that's on your machine, and the physical watts of power that are coming out of the tube. So we've got to draw a graph that relates all those three things together. And in addition to that, there's a very interesting section of the tube performance called a pre-ionization zone, which is where the tube is just starting to fire and it can't make up its mind whether to run on a full beam or a partial beam. There's a, a strange startup characteristic that varies between tubes and it varies between power supplies and machines. But it is important that you understand where that zone is on your machine because it can be very useful and it can be very annoying at times. When I first got my original uh, China Blue laser machine, um, it had a very, very poor quality tube in it. And I struggled for a long time to prove that the power in that tube was not as claimed. I spent a long time trying to devise ways of measuring power through calorimetry techniques. And in the end, uh, I had to give up and I searched the internet for a reasonably priced power meter that enabled me to measure the power coming out of my tube. On the surface of it, it looks like a meat thermometer with a blob of aluminium aerodited to the stem. And in essence, that's what it is. But it's a very expensive piece of equipment, relatively speaking, for a hobby use. This cost me around about uh, $350 because I couldn't buy anything like this in the UK. I had to get it specially imported from the States. This is a company called Macken Instruments. And this is the cheap end of their product range. Think Laser don't use anything like this because they've got very sophisticated equipment that's capable of operating at different frequencies, different wavelengths of light. And their kit is in the region of about maybe two and a half to three thousand pounds. That's not the sort of price that you can afford to spend to check the performance of your machine here. You don't need a piece of sophisticated digital measuring equipment to measure the power on your machine. What you really want is something which is maybe not quite as accurate, something, maybe something like this, that will do the job 
but you know, it doesn't cost a fortune. Although I invested in this, and it did a superb job of telling me everything I wanted to know about the machine, it's still out of the price range of many people. And so consequently, on this site here, RD Works Learning Lab 53, I've done an analysis of how this works, and I've designed my own simple version, cheap version, that will do the same task as this. This reads out watts directly. This does not read out watts directly. It's, it's a compromise. We get the same answer, but we have to put a little bit more effort in. What we're going to be doing today is to use this piece of kit, and I'll show you that, relatively speaking, it is still very simple to use. Now, whether we use this piece of equipment or this piece of equipment, they're both based on, in essence, heating up this block of anodized aluminium. And to do that, you have to put the power in for a fixed period of time. The fixed period of time is something that we've generated a program to do. And all the information about that program is available on the Think Laser website. Think Laser can supply this piece of equipment. So before we can start any testing, we need to put a test program into the machine. And that test program, let's find it. There we go. It's actually called Doohickey. And here's what it looks like. Now, we've got a starting point here, which is the blue. And the first thing that happens is, at a speed of one millimeter a second, we traverse outwards by about 10 millimeters. So that means it's going to take 10 seconds to run up the blue line. And at the end of that period, 10 seconds, we start running around this red spiral, getting closer and closer towards the center. Now, that red spiral has been very carefully designed, its length and its speed has been set to 14 millimeters a second, because that will give us the correct amount of exposure time for the calibration to work. So we don't have to panic when we press the start button because we get nothing happening over the blue line for the first 10 seconds. We've got the power set to 1% and 1% will not work the laser. So we have a little bit of relaxation time from the time we press the button to the time we go around to the back of the machine and get ready for the test to start. Now, it re really doesn't matter where you place the laser head, but somewhere into the middle of the machine is a good idea. And then press your origin button. Whenever I'm firing the laser down into the machine, I always like to put a little tub of water in the bottom of the machine. Because, let me just show you. So after 10 seconds, the power switch is on and we've got it set to maximum power at the moment which is 67 percent and there we go you can see the effect of the energy going into the surface it's actually causing the water to boil and produce steam So that energy would normally be partially reflected off this surface. And that's a risk I don't want to take. So I always fire my beam into a little puddle of water. The heating effect in the water is virtually nil because there's relatively speaking such a small amount of power there. But it is just causing the surface of the water to heat up so much that it evaporates. It only got to go maybe half a millimetre into the surface of the water and it has no effect at all. Okay, so that's the program set up and all the safety precautions. So we need to close the lid. Now what we have got to do now is to keep changing the parameters in this program. And to do that, we shall press enter, enter. And what we're trying to do is we're going to change the parameter, the, the, the power parameter on the red layer. So we need to use the ZU button, well we use the arrow button initially because the blue there tells us that we've got this selected. So we can select the red layer, so we come down to power by using the ZU button. 
Now the first thing that I'm going to do is to wind the power up on this machine and this is minimum power. I'm going to put it to 90% and then we're going to step down to maximum power and we're going to set that to 90% as well. The speed set at 14 millimeters a second and the power set to 90%. So that's our first test that we're going to run. Now the fact that I'm running this at 90% means that I should probably be driving this milliamp meter more than the recommended maximum for the tube. I should be overdriving the tube. But don't let it worry you. For such a short period of time, this is not going to damage your tube. There's warnings on all sorts of other covers, but there isn't a particular warning on here. But believe me, it's just as dangerous to take this cover off and use the machine as it is to undo any of the other panels. So we're basically going to beat the safety system here. So I need to reinforce that you must, at all stages, be very, very careful. And I will try and explain to you how you can do this safely. Okay, now I've got to open the lid to show you what's going on. But you will have to operate this with the lid closed because of the safety systems preventing the tube from firing when we open the lid. Now one of the most important things that we're going to need is a bucket of water. Now this water here is, has been sitting here for several days and it has assumed an ambient room temperature. Now that's most important. We need a consistent starting point when we do every one of these tests using this equipment or even using this equipment because they're based on a temperature change away from room temperature. Okay, before we start, let's take a quick close-up look at this little instrument. Now, the top button here is an on-off button. And that's now registering the temperature that it's seeing in the black doohickey probe beside my hand there. Now, the button at the top right-hand side, we can choose degrees C, degrees F, or degrees absolute. We're going to use the degrees C scale, which is the default scale. And we can see that just up at this top right hand corner here. Now underneath that we've got a hold button, which we don't need to use. But the one button that we do need to use is this button that I've marked black. And I've marked it black because it's very confusing and sometimes you might press the wrong button because you read the, the number is underneath the button and so you think well max mean average let's press this button because that's what you can see but in fact that's wrong so I've marked that button so we never make a mistake the reason why I've marked that button is because if we press it once we get max if we press it a second time we get min and if we press it a third time we get average when we turn the power off it resets everything and we turn the power on and we get nothing. So the first thing that we must do is press the black button, which says max. And what that will now do is that will register the maximum temperature that ever is seen by the doohickey probe. And that's an important number that we need to capture. Now, when it comes to doing the test itself, what we're going to do is we're going to put this little lollipop in front of the laser beam coming out of the tube, just here, like this. And we're going to move it around just so we don't get any intense heating on one particular spot. So under all circumstances, make sure that you keep your hand resting on this bottom corner of the enclosure, because that will ensure that your hand is never in the laser beam path itself. Even though you've got the path covered over by this, if for any reason you jump, somebody sneezes, somebody bangs you, you don't want to do this and finish with the beam on your fingers. So safety, safety, safety. Please look and think what's going to happen. Okay, safety let you out of the way. Let's get on and do the job. Okay, <clears throat> so the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to put the probe into the water bath and we're going to swill it around, turn the meter off and back on, and that will be a live temperature that the doohickey is measuring. 
And when it's stable, and at the moment it's 23, 22.9, yeah, give or take 0 0.2, 0 0.3 in the degree C, it's stable. And it's at around about 22.8 to 23. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to turn that meter off now, and I'm going to walk round to the front of the machine, and I'm going to press the start of the program button. Okay? Now, we're in no immediate panic. We can turn the meter on and we press the max power. 23.1 is the number that I want to see. And here we go. We can see the belt moving. And that tells us that we are got something going on. 23.1 was our starting temperature, remember? And there we go, it's finished. So we need a little piece of paper to write this information down. 90% power. 23.1 was the starting temperature. Now we can take a look on the meter and we can see that it says 55.4. Okay, that's two pieces of vital information that we need, the starting temperature and the finishing temperature. Now there's one other thing that we need to go and look at. Now because we don't have six pairs of hands or five pairs of eyes, um, if you've got some help, then maybe somebody else can read this for you. But if you haven't got help, then you'll need to run the program again, as I will do here. And of course it's safe to run it because we're running it into a bucket of water. And what we shall need to do now is to make a note of the current once the program is running. 24.5 probably. Okay, so that's basically what I'm recording. Power, 90%. Start temperature, 23.1. Maximum temperature that we established, 55.4. And our milliamps, 24.5. Those are the four numbers that we need to record. So we now need to come back to here and we need to press the enter button and enter again. Press the arrow key to get across to the red and then the ZU to get down to the minimum power button. And at that point we're going to change the minimum power to 80. 10% steps is good enough to get a reasonably good calibration graph. You could run it at 5%, 2%. It, it really depends on how um, fussy you are. So max and min are both set to 80%. Enter, enter. And now we go through the same procedure again. And we do that for 70, 60, 50, 40, 30, all the way down to 10%. Now at 10%, things start to change just a little bit. I'll carry on and do all the test results down to 10%. And then we'll come back and have a look a bit closer at what's going on at 10%. The last set of data for 90%, is slightly different to the one that you've seen on the film because I went away for a meal and when I came back I decided I'd start the whole thing again because I do like to make sure that I get a consistent set of results with no time lag in between. So this set of data is a consistent set of data. So there was a temperature rise injected into that little doohickey by virtue of the amount of power that was being fired at it, the amount of heat that was being fired at it. Because what we're going to do, we're going to put the final temperature into a calculation, 57.5, and then we're going to subtract the start temperature from it, which was 24.4. And that gives us an answer of 33.1. Now that's 33.1 degrees C. Now for the speed that I'm running this at, there is a multiplication factor of 2. So if I put times 2 into there, the answer that comes out is 66.2. Now that's 66.2 watts. There is a calibration chart that you can work to, but to be honest, if you're running at 14 millimeters a second, then just taking the difference and multiplying it by 2 gives you the watts. It's a nice, simple, almost mental calculation. This doohickey works over three different ranges. It works up to 40, 40 watts, up to 80 watts, 
and up to, uh, up to 160 watts. None of this stuff is very complex maths. If you like, you have to be a little bit inconvenienced, but then the doohickey is a very cheap way of measuring the power. And to be honest, you don't have to worry about these calculations because I've done a spreadsheet here which subtracts these two numbers from each other and produces a temperature increase. And that temperature increase is multiplied by a factor of two here to give you the power output. And then we also at the same time checked that percentage power and the watts against the current that was showing on the current meter. And so there we are, we've drawn this characterization for the tube. Now this blue line here is power, watts. And this red line here is current, milliamps. Now technically, this machine does not deliver power. When you put percent power into your program, what you're really doing is putting in a percentage of 5 volts DC. And that 5 volts DC is what is used, a percentage of that 5 volt DC is what is used to control the current that is allowed to flow through the tube. That current should therefore be linear. And give or take a little bit of uh, my estimation and the accuracy of the milliamp meter, as you can see, it is, it is pretty well approximately linear. So the power that comes out of this tube is not directly related to the current that you're using to drive the tube with. This is not a linear relationship. People get rather confused and they think that I've got the 60 watt tube, therefore if I put in 50% power, I'm going to get 30 watts out. Well, look, 50% power is in fact going to generate something like about 55 watts. That's not halfway up the scale. And you can see why it's not halfway up the scale, because this is a non-linear characteristic. Now, it's a very strange characteristic because, as I said, we worked down to 10% power. And I hoped that I would get down to 10% power. And you can see that I've just about got there because probably if I drive this down much lower, I might be able to get down to possibly 9.5%. And then I should get no power out of this device at all. So as you can see, it is quite a rapid increase to start with, and then it drops off into a much shallower curve. The other vital piece of information that we must get from this graph now is what is the maximum current that we can allow to drive this machine at? You would normally expect to be able to drive a 60 watt tube to a maximum drive current of 22 milliamps. So let's just find where 22 milliamps is, is here. Okay, now 22 milliamps if we draw that up there like that we get two bits of information. One is 75, 76, 77, maybe 78 percent. And the other piece of information is that at 78% we're getting 62.4. So this tube, a 60 watt tube, is delivering 64 watts at 78% power. And provided we don't program seven, more than 78% into this machine, then we shall not be exceeding the 22 milliamp limit for a 60 watt tube. Now those are crucial pieces of information that you need to know. And you would not be able to get this information without the use of a power meter. So now we've very confidently characterized this machine. Now there's one other piece of information that we might not get on this graph here, and we may have to draw a completely separate graph to look at what's going on in this little area down here. And this is something called the pre-ionization zone. Now, that normally happens somewhere in the region of maybe four to six milliamps. We're going to run and we're going to check what's going on on this machine at between nine and 13 and 14%. 
Now we're going to run the same test again, but what we're going to do this time is to take a look at the tube itself. We're not going to worry about the power because we can see what the power is doing. Now to do this, I'm going to turn the lights out so that you can see what's happening in the tube. Itself. Here we go. Oh, we've got something happening there at 9% power. You can just about see, right at this end here, a very faint glow. So we have got some power there at 9%. And yes, we've just got a small amount of colour at this end of the tube here. Now if we start looking along the tube, we shall find that we have got no, uh, no real discernible beam along the middle of the tube, just at the end here. So here's what 11% looks like, and now we're starting to get more along the tube. But it still isn't all the way along the tube, it's only part way along the tube, up to this label here, look. And you can see how the beam is jumping around at the end there. Okay, now this is 12%. You can see the beam is getting stronger, and it's also getting longer. Look, it's gone beyond that label now. It's nearly making it all the way along the tube. And again, look how jumpy the beam is at the front here. Right, we're now going up to 13%, which is where we think the beam is nearly going to make it along the tube. It's still jumping around a lot at this end, as you can see, and... There is just the faintest glow that goes more or less all the way along the tube, look. But it's still not what I would call a continuous beam, because look, we've still got it jumping around at the end there. And that jumping around is a characteristic of this pre-ionisation phase. Now this is 14%. Yes, you can see we've still got a jumpy beam there. And we're getting a much stronger beam, and it's more or less, well it is all the way along the tube now, but we've still got this jumpy characteristic there on that cathode. Well we're now at 15%, it's still a bit jumpy there, and we're getting quite a good solid beam all the way along, but you can see how it's, the whole beam is a little bit jittery. Okay, now this is 16%, and look, we're switching pretty good now. We've got a steady beam. Can you see that? It's flipping, but it's basically a nice steady beam. It's no longer jittery. And just to verify that, here we are driving at 20%. And as you can see, we've got a nice steady pink beam all the way along here and a little bit of movement on the cathode, but it's not jittery movement, it is just like a little teeny weeny pulsing movement. Now we should be able to go backwards and we should be able to find that at 15%, that different characteristic. 15% was the upper threshold of this pre-ionization zone. Now you can see that jittery behavior on the cathode, and if you listen carefully, you may be able to hear it hissing. Now look, it's gone to steady mode now, so it's on a, on a cusp of being stable and unstable at 15%. So therefore I think the limit probably is 14%. So let's just drop back to 14%. Right, and here we are at 14%. As you can see, it's, it is a weak looking beam. It isn't a lovely solid pink beam. It's a bit wispy. But it's this jumping around characteristic that is the thing that gives away this pre-ionization. Okay, so there we are. Anywhere between 9 and 14% for this particular tube is the pre-ionization zone. Okay, so I've marked the pre-ionization zone on this graph now, and you can see it's between nine and 14%, and at 14%, it means that we're actually somewhere in the region of around about 12 watts. So we don't get steady power out of this tube until 12 watts. Now, if you really want to be exploratory and fussy, you can check 
1% points through this range and out the other side. But you'll find that it really doesn't do anything strange. It tends to just follow this curve. So there's nothing strange about the power output curve in relation to the percentage power or basically in relation to this steady rise in drive current. But this characteristic here has got some interesting and strange properties and that's something which we should discuss in a future session. Okay well armed with this piece of paper now we've got a great deal of confidence about how we're going to be able to use this machine. Now remember back to when we were doing parameters and I said the real thing that you need to do is to measure power and instead of specifying percentages in your descriptions of parameters you need to put in real power and this is how you'll be able to do it you'll be able to refer to this graph now and if you had parameters in there for a previous tube and my previous tube ran at 67 percent this one runs at 78 percent so it's a completely different graph but it's not going to be a difficult job for me to run through my parameters and correct those parameters for this machine now so I hope that you can see now the advantage of investing in a, a small piece of kit like this. And it doesn't matter which piece of kit you use because the results will be the same. This is a very affordable tool, okay? A little bit more inconvenient, but it does the job that you want to do. And of course, the other great thing about this is we shall now be able to go round each mirror and we'll be able to check the power in and the power out of each mirror so we can determine the power losses across the mirror and the power losses across a lens. Now the problem is when you get to my age you find that you've only got one or maybe 1.5 grey cells left and you really don't want to overload them so just as a little reminder I'll put that on there so that I don't forget. That's the maximum programmable power that I can put into this machine now without overdriving the tube. 78%. That's the magic number. I hope you've got some benefit from today's session. And I was just going to say cheerio to you. But as I stand here, I'm looking over at that keyboard. Where I'm using these keys, I'm very quickly going to start wearing off the letters. I think I've worn through these two sheets of plastic on quite a few of these. And we're talking about only six or eight months, well, probably about eight months that I've had this machine. So I think on the next session, what we're going to have to do is to make something that I've made for my other keyboard. And that's a little clear protective screen. So you can see that I push on the buttons through this flexible membrane and the buttons themselves do not get damaged. The problem with this is, on this machine, I haven't got as much room and as you can see, this is going to get in the way of closing the door. So I'm going to have to change the design of this in some way so that it can be used on this machine. I haven't worked out how I'm going to do that yet, but maybe that's a project for next time. Well, this time I'll try not to get distracted, so for real this time, Cheerio, and I'll see you in the next session.